everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. So as you may see by the video's title, we're going to be doing another video in my cultural examination series and today we're tackling Shara. Now you might be saying to yourself, Nablus, didn't you already do this video? Uh, isn't that one of your most viewed videos? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. But the first video was one of the very first videos I ever made for the channel. I had less than 100 subscribers at the time I made it. And as with some of those other early ones, I've come a long way in my research, delivery, graphics, and just overall not totally sucking. Even though I still suck a little bit, just not as much suck. So anyways, you may see me remake a few of my older videos that need a touch up here in the next couple weeks. I'm actually adding a bunch of content to them so it's not just the same video all over again. Hopefully it's going to be a lot better starting with this one. So before we get into the examination of Shara, let me quickly thank the video's sponsor, Audible.com, but more on them later. Let's get right to it and throw up a spoiler warning for the video. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through a memory of light. If you haven't finished the books yet, come back and watch this video later. I don't want you spoiled. You have been warned. So if you've seen my other cultural analysis videos before, I'm going to break down the analysis into 10 sections to kind of organize my thoughts. Those sections are as follows. History, demographics and culture, geography, economy, governmental structure and law, military, overall power, significant landmarks, significance to the story, and then what happens after the story. Then after that, I'll give you my take on Shara as a culture within the Wheel of Time and let you know if I think they were executed well. So let's take a look at the mysterious land of Shara from the Wheel of Time. Not much is known about Sharan history other than a few sparse details given by Sharan residents, but they're not known to give truthful accounts. Of what we do know of Shara, the nation dates back to almost the breaking of the world. It is thought that the land that became Shara was once a few different nations, each settled in the aftermath of the breaking. However, roughly 300 years after the end of the breaking of the world, again some 2700 years prior to the start of the books, the lands of Shara were united under a single autocratic ruler. During the time after this, the nation of Shara solidified its boundaries and established the culture that would last until the time of the books. In roughly the year 1000 after the breaking, Trollocs invaded Shara just as they did in the Westlands and in the Aeol Waste, in what would become known as the Trolloc Wars in the Westlands. The Sharans were able to fend off the Trolloc invasion, being unified while the Westlands were broken into smaller nations that didn't really come to each other's aid. Many Sharans today claim that the Trollocs never came, but it's known that they did. Almost a thousand years later, in 993 of the Free Years, Arter Hawkwing sent a large fleet to invade Shara just as he had done with his fleet to conquer the Shanchan continent. That fleet was approximately 2,000 ships and had almost 300,000 troops, led by one of Hawkwing's daughters. The Seafolk reported that the fleet successfully landed at several places on the western and southern parts of Shara, but they later reported that those ships were seen set aflame seemingly indicating that the invasion was defeated and destroyed. The Sharans again deny that this ever happened, but the Seafolk confirmed that they witnessed it. In 506 of the New Age, the Aeol gave the Kyrian people permission to send traders across the Aeol Waste to trade with the Sharans at their trade cities at the very edge of the Waste. For roughly 470 years continuously, the Kyrian traded with the Sharans, creating what was known as the Silk Road, and making the Kyrianan very rich. Now this was ended when King Laman Damadred chopped down the Avendalora Dera tree that the Isle had given the Kyrianan as a gift to make a throne. Now only independent peddlers are allowed to make the trip across the waste and very few make that trip, forcing most of the trade from the Sharans to come from the Seafolk traders at their port cities rather than the cities in the waste. In 999 of the New Age, Grendel, while snatching up rulers just to be her pets, abducted the two rulers of the Sharan people and kept them as her pets in Aradoman. Now this throws the entire Sharan nation into chaos as the ruling line was broken for the first time in their recorded history without a clear replacement. We'll talk more about the Sharan government here in a moment, but losing both rulers at once completely breaks down the government of Shara. Now during the chaos that ensued from this, Damondred, trying to stir up further chaos, sparks a slave uprising leading many of the slaves to revolt on their masters and causing a civil war. It's at this time, roughly two years prior to the commencement of the last battle, that Damondred learns of Sakarnan, the second most powerful Sa'angriol ever created for a man, 
in its rumored hiding place in Shara. He seeks it out, taking the role of a Sharan slave to learn about its location. Now, while posing as a slave, he inadvertently fulfills a couple Sharan prophecies about the Wild, or the Sharan savior that would come to protect them and kill the Dragon Reborn. He sparks a slave uprising over their masters, earns the respect and obedience of the Sharan Chandler class, the Ayad. So he has the slaves following him, he has the Chandlers following him. They begin to see him as their prophesied leader. He's at first reluctant to accept this role, but he begins begins to feel more and more connection to these people, and he unites much of the nation behind him, and he finds one half of the Sakarnan. Now, he doesn't have the other piece of the Sangriel, so his search eventually leads him to a place called the Aberwark. It's a massive canyon filled with dense jungle. Now, it's said that the wild will enter, and then three days later return with the Sakarnan, or with the cup as they call it. So, Demondred enters the canyon, fights a full-grown Jumara, which is a worm that's fully grown, which basically looks like a dragon if you're not, it's described as looking like a dragon dragon without wings. He kills the remains of a Nim inside that cave, and he returns with the cup, which is the head of the Sakarnan. And now, as the wild, he has unified most of the Sharan people behind him. It's at this point that the Sharans become very relevant to the story. The Aes Sedai are headed towards total victory in Kandor during the last battle, which would have led the forces of the light to rout the forces of the shadow if they could have refocused their armies and channelers. The Sharans surprise attack the Aes Sedai camp and kill almost 120 Aes Sedai, almost immediately behind the Ayad and the Madred linked uh, with them, and the Sakarnan, which is again that very strong Sa'angriol. The Sharan appearance on the battlefield and then the subsequent battles after that almost win the entire battle for the forces of the Shadow. If not for Demondred's desire to duel and defeat Rand directly, he likely could have defeated all of the forces of the Light by himself, with linked with all those channelers and the Sakarnan. Instead, Demondred believes that Rand is commanding the defenses for the forces of the Light and taunts him throughout the battle. The Sharan channelers are eventually destroyed by Egwene Alvir using the Flame of Tarvalin, and Demondred himself is killed by Lan Mandragoran, leading to the surrender and the defeat of the remaining Sharan army and ending their involvement in the story. Most of the information about Shara comes from both the companion books and the short story River of Souls, which is a part of the unfettered anthology of short stories. River of Souls discusses Demondred and Shara in his search for the Sakarnan. I will have links to both of these books in the description of the video. They are for sale on shopwheeloftime.com, so if you buy them there, you're going to help the channel out a ton. Thanks for those of you that have been buying stuff there. That's awesome. So we're never really given any specifics about the population and the major cities for the Sharan people. But we can make some educated guesses by what we see in the books. There are likely millions of Sharans if you judge by the population of the other lands that we know of and the relative size to the Westlands. Although it's likely that Shara is not as densely populated as the Westlands, its sheer size just indicates a large population and they had the ability to hold off a Trolloc invasion and the invasion of Ardor Hawkwing's armies so that tends to lead me to believe there's a fairly large population. We can assume that the population is somewhat limited and that they grow all their own food, and they don't really rely on any trade of any kind, so they must be able to support their population on their own land. Sharns tend to have darker skin, with some of them being extremely dark-skinned. Not much is known of how they dress, as they do not often show their faces, and they're almost always cloaked and veiled while in their trading cities. They're an extremely secretive people. They believe their culture to be superior to the outsiders, and so they keep basically everything about themselves, from the way they look, from the way they talk, to the way they dress, to the way their country actually looks. They keep all of that a secret from foreigners. Sharan society is divided between a couple different social groups. The majority of the Sharan society are slaves, being under the rule of nobles and other owners. Slaves in Shara are treated as animals, and can either be sold or killed with no repercussions as they are simply animals. Sharan society is generally structured around the few having complete control over the masses. Another group in Sharan society are the Ayad. The Ayad are channelers of the one power in Shara. Now, Ayad can be men and women, but there are different rules for male and female Ayad. The Ayad live in walled cities and are isolated from the rest of society. For the most part, they are not allowed to associate with non-Ayad people, so non-channelers at all. All Ayad are tattooed on their faces at birth and are bred with other Ayad. So if someone begins channeling that was not brought up as Ayad, they have their face tattooed and are sent to live in one of their cities. Male Ayad are treated as breeding stock and are not taught anything other than how to care for themselves. At the age of 16, a male Ayad is hooded and taken to a distant village and matched with a female Ayad who want to carry his children. He will be used to breed children until his 21st birthday 
or until he begins to channel. At this point, he's hooded and taken away again, told that he's going to another village. But rather than being taken to another village though, he's actually killed and his body is cremated. It's forbidden for Ayod and non-Ayod to mate, and if this is done, there's a penalty of death for both parties involved. If such a union created a child, the child would be left outside to die in the elements. Again, the Sharans are a really nice people. Another class of the Sharan society is the Abrishi. Now, not much is known about them, but Abrishi are monk-like figures that have a very highly respected place in Sharan society. They're respected as wise counselors to lords and slaves alike. It's said that no Sharan would ever disturb an Abrishi while they're meditating, as unfavorable fates come to those who do, and that includes royalty all the way down to slaves. We also know that there are guilds within Sharan society. One that we know of is the Counters Guild that assists and governs transactions and measurements in the society. There's an implication that there are many other guilds, but we just don't know much about that. The only Sharan cities that we actually know of are the six trading towns along the Cliffs of Dawn, and the five large port cities on the southern coast. All of these cities are completely walled off from the mainland, with the wall not only preventing anyone from entering Shara proper, but they also block views to the interior, so pretty much nothing is known beyond those cities. In terms of the other aspects of Sharan culture, it's said that they are very untrusting of outsiders, and outsiders don't trust them. Sharans view themselves as set apart and different from those in other cultures. The morality that they follow is just different. They don't have views as to what is wrong or right, but what is utilitarian in their view about what needs done and what doesn't need done. They're able to follow Demondred, for example, even though he tells them that they will be doing evil things and that they will be fighting alongside Trollocs because they view this as necessary, it's what needs done, as part of fulfilling their prophecy of defeating the dragon and stopping the destruction of the world. The landmass of Shara is enormous, being larger than the rest of the continent combined. Yet it's smaller than the entire continent of the Shancham. It stretches about 3,500 miles east to west at its largest point, narrowing in the south, and then 5,300 miles north to south uh, from the ocean to the Mountains of Doom. The eastern border is the Morinal Ocean, and the west is the Cliffs of Dawn and the Great Rift, and the southern border being the Aerith Ocean. And then, of course, the northern border being the Mountains of Doom and the Blight. The Cliffs of Dawn are a huge, sheer cliff face stretching over 1,200 miles from the Mountains of Doom to the beginnings of the Great Rift in the south. The cliffs vary in height from 100 to 500 feet, making an enormous natural boundary. There are only six passes that allow passage, and these are where the walled trading towns are located, and that's what's used to trade across the Silk Road and the Iole Waste. The Great Rift is a colossal chasm formed during the breaking of the world. It extends about 2,400 miles north to south and stops just short of the Aerith Ocean in the south. The Great Rift is between one and three miles deep and over 100 miles wide at its widest point, creating an utterly uncrossable barrier. The rift itself is lifeless and barren, and it's actually hotter than the Ayo Waste. Think like a combination of the Grand Canyon and Death Valley. Massive mountains lie on the eastern side of the rift as well, making this even more impassable to access Shara proper. The interior of Shara is unknown, but it can be guessed that there are large rainforests in the interior, just based on geography and a couple passages we get from River of Souls. The mountains and cliffs of Dawn on the western border must keep the wind and moisture from reaching the Ayo Waste, causing it to be the desert that it is. This would cause there to be near constant rainfall in Shara, creating areas that are likely dense rainforest. The eastern coast of Shara is largely unexplored, except for a very few seafolk vessels that have been off the shore. Sharan channelers will destroy any vessel that comes near the eastern coast. Aside from a few mountains and hill chains, the seafolk report nothing of note is visible from the coast. Much of the economy that we know from Shara is in the trade of silk and ivory, of which they are the only source in the world other than Shanshan. Silkworms are protected in Shara. There are very harsh consequences for stealing them, as to protect the silk trade. Until the entry of the Shanshan into the story, there was no way to get silk other than from Shara, giving them a total and complete monopoly on the trade. This trade is conducted at the walled trading towns in the Cliffs of Dawn, and in the southern coastal port cities that we mentioned earlier. Sharans are veiled and incredibly secretive with foreigners. The foreigners are not allowed to even see the interior of Shara, given that the trade cities are walled so high that it's impossible to see past. Sharans are known to be renowned liars with trade. Because they believe their culture is superior, they do not believe that foreigners deserve to be told the truth about anything. 
including the goods that they're buying. Traders typically learn to check their purchases very carefully. For example, when buying silk cloth, the bolts must be unwound and checked from beginning to end to ensure the full length is given and the material is the same throughout. No one would do business with the Sharans if not for the extreme profitability of the trade in silk and ivory. The sea folk, being notoriously difficult traders themselves, are really the only people that manage to trade anymore with Shara as they are good at dealing with the Sharans. Outside of these trade cities, not much else is known about the Sharan economy other than they appear to be completely self-sufficient with no need to import goods of any kind. It's also an economy built around slave labor as the majority of Sharans are slaves to their noble masters. Slave-based economies tend to lead to vast income and wealth inequality as those that can afford slaves tend to become even more wealthy and those that can't afford slaves really can't become wealthy. But again, this is just a guess given the very limited information that we have on Sharan society. Speaking of economy, money is important. And as I make a transition to working on YouTube on a more full-time basis, the channel needs more and more support just to keep it going. One of the best ways that you can support the channel without having to actually pay anything is through our channel's main sponsor, audible.com. They're gonna give you a free audiobook just for being one of my viewers. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and sign up for the free trial and get a free book. Just by doing so, you really help the channel out financially. And for that, I'm super grateful. And the best part is you get to keep the book even if you decide not to keep the Audible service. So you can potentially get a book for free without spending a dime. Anyways, back to the video. Sharans claim that they have been one nation completely at peace since the breaking of the world, with no rebellions and no wars of any kind. Now, while we know that's not completely true, it does appear that the Sharans have a history of autocratic rule that appears to be unbroken for that period of time. The land of Shara is ruled by an absolute monarch. If the ruler is a female, the monarch is called the Shabon. If the monarch is a male, he is called the Shabote. The Shabon and the Shabote select a mate and then they rule absolutely for a period of seven years. At the end of the seven year reign, the monarch dies, passing the rule to their mate, who then selects a new mate, and the cycle repeats. This is said to have continued since the breaking of the world and is called the will of the pattern, or as they call it, the will of the tapestry. In actuality, it's the female Ayad that really rule. Although outwardly the Ayad are the servants of the ruler, it's the female Ayad who kill the ruler after seven years and control access to the ruler themselves. The female Ayad are allowed to leave the Ayad cities only in service of the ruler, which everyone assumes is the case, but since the Ayad are controlling the ruler, they essentially get to do what they want. In regards to laws, the aforementioned laws pertaining to the Ayad and their mating in the cities are the only ones that we really know about. It's not permitted for Ayad and non-Ayad to mate, and the Ayad are supposed to be confined to their cities. So again, that's really the only law that we know about. It's also law that outsiders are not permitted to be into the country, and they are not permitted to learn of anything of Sharan culture. Now this Structure is destroyed, however, when Grendel kidnaps both the rulers at the same time, leaving a major power vacuum. Damadred then leads a slave uprising in Shara and overthrows the remaining nobles, and he becomes the de facto dictator of the slaves and the Ayad until their defeat in the last battle. While not much is known about the Sharan military, we do have a few small details. Sharan soldiers have been seen wearing knee-length garments made of padded armor and reinforced with chainmail. Most Sharan soldiers carry hand axes as their primary weapon. Now, they're not extremely well equipped, and that can be assumed that most of the army that we see are former slaves, because there probably wasn't much need for a large standing army in Shara prior to the last battle, given they weren't fighting anybody. The Ayad have tattooed faces and serve in the military as well, unbound by the three oaths though, like the Aes Sedai are. Many Sharan soldiers are also tattooed with their clothing having diamond shaped holes to show these tattoos, and it's obviously a sign of status. The military consisted of mostly footmen and Ayat. We're never given total numbers of their armed forces, but it can be assumed many hundreds of thousands. But again, these are not experienced soldiers and most, most likely freed slaves fighting for their nation under the command of the Mandarin. Now again, it's hard to gauge the overall power of the Sharan culture based on how little we know of them, but we can extrapolate a few things. The military appears to be at least moderately powerful with mostly slave soldiers. It's hard to get a feel for their overall total power given their seclusion for most of the story, but we do know that they did survive both the Trolloc Wars and the invasion from Martyr Hawkwing's forces, so it can be assumed that they can summon a powerful military when needed, 
and again have that military be supported by the channelers or the ayat. Economically, they're the only source of both silk and ivory until the Shan Chan come in, and while these are not vital commodities, they have a high demand in the Westlands, and whoever can procure them can become quite wealthy. Given the combination of their apparent size and power of the military, their economic stranglehold over certain industries, it can be stated that the Sharans could be a powerful force if they ever chose to break their secluded way of life. There are no man-made landmarks in Shara that we know of, so really just geographical landmarks that we can list here. The two primary landmarks are the Cliffs of Dawn and the Great Rift, which the latter of which is probably the most impressive. It's a leftover from the breaking of the world, and it serves as a barrier to entry into Shara. Aside from being absolutely breathtaking to look at, it's utterly desolate and unable to sustain any life. Basically, like I said earlier, think of it as a much larger version of the Grand Canyon crossed over with Death Valley, so it's like in, inhospitable. Another landmark that we really don't know much about is the Abra Ward, which is where the River of Souls is located and where Demondred is able to not only procure the second piece of the Sakarnan, but also establish himself as a figure of prophecy for the Sharn people as the Wild or also known as the Dragon Slayer. The Sharns are really non-existent for much of the story. They play a very major role, though, in the final book. Without the Sharn military forces or the Sharn channelers arriving unexpectedly, the last battle likely would have been a rout for the forces of the light. They were able to travel, they had more channelers, and they were defeating Trolloc armies before the Sharns arrived and entered the battle. The Aes Sedai were on the verge of victory on their battlefront in Kandor, and with that many channelers that would then be free to assist in the other theaters of the war, the battle would have clearly been turned in favor of the light. The Sharans not only decimated the White Tower forces, but they gave the forces of the Shadow the channelers they needed to actually fight against the forces of the light. So what happens after? Well, here's what I think. At the end of the last battle, most of the Ayat are dead, killed by Egwene with the Flame of Tarval. The wild is gone and most of their government is destroyed and their slaves have been freed. I believe the secrecy they operated under previously is also gone because of the widespread knowledge of traveling and that makes areas that were previously unaccessible now accessible. I think there will be conflict potentially between Shara and the Westlands though as the Sharans fought for the side of the shadow and they are so different culturally from the rest of the nations that even really the Shan Chan. The Sharans are also not subject to the Dragon's Peace, and therefore they may be a source of conflict. But much of their military as we know it is destroyed, and many of their channelers are gone. It is possible that with a more open culture and exchange of ideas, slavery will disappear, and the basis of their culture will cease to exist, potentially, and potentially opens the door for peace as well. So what do I think of Shara? I, I actually think it's a really cool addition to the story. It's a very different culture from the other two. Like, if you think of the Westlands as a major culture and you think of the Shan Chan as a major culture, the Sharans share similarities with, with the Shan Chan in terms of some types of slavery, but it's very, very different. And I find that to be really interesting because through the history of our world, there have been very different cultures with very different beliefs and very different uh, ethos for the way that they look at morality. The Sharans are very clearly that. Um, and I love their addition to the story. I wish we had more on them, um, but I also love the mystery that surrounds them. So what do you all think of Shara? Did I miss anything? What do you think happens to Shara at the end of the books? Please leave a comment in the, in the comments below. Let me know what you think. Also, big thank you to all of you that support me on Patreon. You are really what makes this channel possible at this point. YouTube ad revenue has been much lower during Corona. And as I'm transitioning to doing this more full time, your support is not only appreciated, but really necessary for me to keep running. The absolute best way to support the channel is through Patreon. I am currently running a promotion on the Patreon that's gonna end in the next three days. Anyone that signs up for the Dreadlord tier on my Patreon or higher will receive a code for 10% off at shopwheeloftime.com. In addition to the other benefits you get at those tiers, you can find a link to that in the description below. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here, so if you love the Wheel of Time, smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, everybody, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. 
The mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? 